secret identity here, and it's okay, I have a t-shirt underneath. <laughs> but it's taking longer than it should have, so it's more dramatic. So here's the, uh, the Batman shirt. So we'll put that on. So. It's kind of a neat little shirt because it's got an old style sort of Batman, the way he was stylized back in the, in the 50s. So the basic idea here is when I thought about Batman, I was thinking about examining a superhero. And one of the things I was trying to find out about was this question of, is it really possible for a human being to attain the skills and abilities of somebody like Batman? Batman represents the pinnacle of human performance. You know, the way he's portrayed in comics and movies and so on. Ultimate, most highly trained athlete we can imagine is represented by, by Batman. So Batman's also the perfect superhero to ask a question about, could you become a superhero? Because there's nothing supernatural about his abilities. When we think of Batman, it isn't like he was born on some other planet like Superman and therefore has powers. Kind of a weak story, really, but has powers because he comes to Earth and can do all these kind of things. There are a lot of other heroes like Spider-Man, where you get bitten by a radioactive spider. It's a kind of loosey-goosey meaning behind the powers. But Batman it seems like it's a human being with powers that are within our reach. But are they really within our reach? And that's really the premise of this discussion I want to have right now, this presentation, and then the focus of the book I wrote. And really, it comes down to the question of how hard would it really be to train to become Batman? And can the human body actually respond <coughs> to such training? Because there's the idea of things you could do, and things that are actually possible to achieve, and they're not always the same thing. Batman's mystique, of course, down the ages, has been, he's been very attractive to many people, and one of the things I had to do when I was writing the book was do a lot of Batman research. I had to read a lot of comic books and read a lot of uh, other materials to supplement my scientific knowledge, making sure I knew exactly what people thought about Batman. When I did that, I came across these really interesting quotes from people who'd written Batman stories, edited Batman, been artists for Batman uh, comic books. And you see these things underlined here. Ordinary mortal, human being, most realistic of the great superheroes. So one of the things, when you look at some of these quotes, and in particular this one at the bottom here by a, a very famous uh, editor and author, uh, Denny O'Neill, who worked with many different characters, including Batman and Iron Man, is that he says, there isn't a great stretch between Batman's world and ours. He's the most realistic of the great superheroes. To be blunt, the guy isn't very super. He didn't gain his powers by being lightning struck, nor bathing in chemicals, nor by dint of being born on another planet, nor by the intervention of extraterrestrials or gods. He, to paraphrase an old commercial, he got them the old fashioned way. He earned them. He wasn't bequeathed those abilities. He sweated for, for them. And one of the things about Batman then is this issue of process. It isn't the kind of thing where you just magically something happens and you get abilities. He somehow had to go through some transformation to get those abilities. Now for those of you who aren't aware of who is Batman, Batman first appeared in May 1939 in Detective Comics number 27, which is shown here, 10 cents a comic book back then. He appeared in a story called The Case of the Chemical Syndicate, 
we weren't really told much about who Batman was or why he existed or anything in this comic. We just sort of showed up. Does anybody have this comic book at home? Uh, because if you do, it's worth over a million dollars. So if you actually have a copy, don't throw it away. You should keep it, even if it's in like poor condition. But it sold a few months ago at auction at $1.1 million, I think, in New York. So if you have a good copy, hold on to it. Now, usually, and I've done this uh, presentation at many different sort of venues, at schools, at comic book conventions, at scientific conferences, lots of different places over the last couple of years, probably to five or 6,000 people. And I always do a little poll at about this stage and say, who wants to be Batman? Really, just about half? That's it, really? That's okay, you don't have to want to. Oh, pardon me, by the way. Uh, being Batman means being Batgirl, being Batwoman, being Robin. All the Bat family, really. So it's, it's all inclusive, as you'll see. Again, can we get a show of hands, please? Okay, some people are voting twice. I'll we'll count them twice. We'll pretend we're a Banana Republic for a bit. Um, so the idea here is that lots of people want to actually be Batman. But if we actually thought about what the job description would look like, like, look like, let's look through that, and then later on we're going to talk about whether you still want to be Batman. So let's say you're looking in uh, the newspaper or on Craigslist or something, and you come across this ad, wanted supremely skilled vigilante to dispense nocturnal justice. What an interesting title you might think to yourself. Well, I wonder what the job requirements are for this. Well, let's look. First of all, you need to walk, work long and odd hours to the point of complete physical and mental exhaustion. Sounds challenging, you know, very tiring, but still, you know, okay, lots of jobs involved, long hours and hard work. You must, this seems different, must be in complete control of your emotions at all times. Well, that seems like an odd thing to have in the job description and probably difficult to do, but let's go with that. Okay, so still I can see maybe doing this. You must at the same time be in tip-top all-round physical condition. Now there gets some, must be some significant physical demands to this job. Next, you have to defend against all manner of attacks delivered by attackers bent on killing and maiming, or both, probably both, and in either direction, while replying with non-lethal force. So now you've got some job where people are trying to kill you all the time, but you're not actually going to kill them, you're going to try and just stop them. So it requires a lot of skill, apparently, and it's sounding fairly dangerous, this job description. You must be detached from matters of finance. They describe the compensation package as Spartan which is code for there is no money. So you have to do this job just because you'd like to and not really get paid for it. You also need to have an unparalleled combination of genetic endowment, desire, training, and your own money to fund all your training and your job. And lastly, you need to be committed, out, committed to burning out rather than fading away. So this job really doesn't sound all that attractive when you look at it like this. So let's see why we might have a job requirement listing like this in a want to that. Well, I asked later again. I asked now if you think about who wants to become Batman. Because it's not the same as being Batman. Being, somebody voted or you want to be Batman or Batgirl or something, right? It'd be like I just go, you're Batgirl, and you've got fantastic powers and abilities, and you can do all kinds of stuff. That's being something. What if I said to become something? There's a lot more work involved, process involved. Let's think about it this way. Lots of people typically want to be lots of things. Not as many people want to become those things. Because becoming them requires the work and effort involved in gaining skills and abilities. So when we think about whether it's even possible to become Batman, that's why the title of the book I wrote is called Becoming Batman, not Being Batman. To find out means looking at the science behind how the body works and actually responds to any kind of training using Batman as an example. The underlying point of this is to really, for us to appreciate what we can achieve, and if we can't, maybe choose not to be an actual superhero. Because understanding how Batman's body works helps us to understand how our own bodies work. One of the things uh, that's very interesting when you, di you dig into a character like Batman, you find all sorts of things in the comics about um, what Batman's done and, and what he did for his training and so on. This panel here came from Detective Comics 1933 back in... Uh, Batman, uh, which was also reprinted in Batman 1 in the spring of 1940, in a story called The Legend of the Batman, um, who he is and how he came to be. What you see here is the first time Batman's training was ever described in the comic books. It's not very detailed, as you might be able to tell. Apparently, and I have to admit that I, I didn't, until I wrote the book and was doing the research into getting all I knew 
know, learn about Batman and training and what was in the comic books. I had never read this particular story. And, you know, I am an actual scientist in my normal job. So I, I went to, gone to school for a long time. On the left-hand side is his scientific training. On the right-hand side is his physical training. So I went to school for a long time to get my PhD and then and become a professor. And I've been doing martial arts for almost 30 years. I spent a lot of time doing stuff. Evidently, to gain lots of skills and abilities, I just had to stare at a beaker or something smoky very intently, because he looks very serious. And ah, he's getting something, he's gaining enlightenment. Or the right, just hold a gigantic barbell over my head in one hand. So we look at the early descriptions. These really probably aren't going to be detailed enough to really give us the skills and abilities of Batman or his intellect. Instead, we need to learn quite a bit more if we want to appreciate what it takes to go from Bruce to Bat, from Bruce Wayne to the fully fledged trained Batman. It means understanding a bit about genetics, exercise physiology, biomechanics, motor control, skill learning, so neuroscience, repetitive strain injuries, which we'll come back to, and performance across the lifespan. The overriding principle, though, for the idea of whether you can become Batman or whether you can become anything when it comes to the physical body that we all have is this principle of stress and plastic change. And this comes within a framework, a scientific framework of stress. Now, nowadays, uh, stress is a real byword for lots of things, and it's negative. Oh, I'm stressed, I'm stressed, I'm getting stressed. Are you getting stressed when I say stress? When I say stress, does it make your heart, do you feel stressed? Are you getting stressed now as I talk to you, I look at you, and now I'm shaking my hand, and now everyone's looking at you as well, and you're getting stressed. So, stress has a negative concept. But in fact, stress is this idea of providing some kind of input to a system and having that system change. And we've got on the sideline here three different scientists, Claude Bernard at the top, in the middle is a, a guy named Walter Cannon, and the bottom is a fellow named Hans Selye. These were very important scientists in physiology, and in fact, the, Claude Bernard is, is known as the father of physiology because of his views on how bodies work and his ideas around the fluid environment that's in the bodies. That, you know, we always hear about how much the body is contained contains some fluid, and we're mostly liquid and water and all this. And Bernard's ideas were all around this idea that if we really are a fluid environment, how does everything interact within and between cells? In the 40s, a guy named Walter Cannon, who was exposed to many different uh, uh, things on the battlefield as a trauma surgeon during World War II, had some very specific ideas, uh, pardon me, World War I, had very specific ideas about uh, the, how the body responds. When we get to the, the, that era, he introduced a term actually called homeostasis. Homeostasis really just represents this idea that your body is typically balanced and will adapt to things so that it comes to some kind of balance point where everything can function generally. Hans Selye in 1935, who was originally from Hungary but uh, settled in, in Montreal at the McGill University, did some studies in the rat that became the foundation upon which almost everything that was known about how or, uh, systems and organisms adapted to stress with something called the Generalized Adaptation Syndrome, which has the unfortunate acronym of GAS. Um, but anyways, Hans Selye had this idea that if you apply stresses, the organism will change to adapt to the stresses to a point. If you apply too much stress, physical, emotional, whatever it is, the animal won't be able to adapt and will, and will die, will get ill and die. When we think of this, really, this, this idea of stress and change, in the concept of Batman. This is really representing the idea of the capacity your body, or Bruce Wayne's body, has to adapt or change or to respond to injury. 